Hey everyone, welcome back to the Defender Track. I'm Mohamed Farhan, a volunteer in OWASP community, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, during the next 45 minutes, you'll be listening to Chenko Wong present defending against new phishing attacks that abuse OAuth authorization code. So please submit if you have any questions during the session, the Q&A tab, just write to this video on the Hua platform. I'll be asking your questions in the last 10 minutes of this session. Please note that the chat function in Zoom is disabled for that entity. So you can leave all your comments in the chat tab in Hua. So a quick introduction about uh, Jenko. So he, Jenko Wong is like a principal researcher in Netscope's threat research team, researching emerging cloud threats. Prior to Netscope, he has held roles in product management and engineering at companies such as Cisco, Tipco, as well as security startups. Uh, which had markets in vulnerability scanning, antivirus, anti-spam appliances, penetration testing, threat intelligence, and Active Directory security. Uh, he has had product, production deployments at enterprise customers, including Walmart, Microsoft, Lucent, Chase, and European banks. So welcome, Jenko, to the OWASP Global Apps at EU. Over to you. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. I'm uh, appreciative of the opportunity to speak at Virtual AppSec. Uh, we have a lot of content. Uh, I'd like to talk about how we can defend against a new class of attacks that are targeting and using um, OAuth itself. So we have a lot to cover and um, apologize in advance. We may get um, some information overload, but I'll do my best to abstract it so that you can take away some key, key items. So really, we want to talk about what we have to do differently, which really presumes that we know what's changing on the tax side. And in short, um, what we'll go through in the next 45 or 50 minutes is a lot of our assumptions no longer apply. A lot of the defensive controls that we've used to prevent phishing attacks or credential attacks are not as effective or are ineffective. We have a high focus on domain and URL filtering right now, not only for phishing, uh, but also for malware delivery. Um, in the new world with OAuth, uh, those aren't effective anymore. And we'll talk about why. Uh, if OAuth credentials are compromised, MFA controls are bypassed effectively. They don't apply. So some of our assumptions of mitigating compromised credentials don't apply. In some cases, depending on the vendor environment, it is really easy for the attacker to move laterally within your environment. The logging and auditing that is done with OAuth activities is immature and minimal. So all, all of our detection tooling and controls are hindered and handicapped because of a lack of uh, information. And should you be fortunate to know that you are compromised, remediating the situation, namely revoking access can be a challenge at best. So this is what we're going to talk about. And, and why are we in this stage, you might ask. It's because the attackers are smart and they are adapting the attacks to now be specific to the protocol at hand. In this case, we're talking about OAuth, which essentially is the de facto standard for users to dynamically grant access to third-party applications to their cloud resources. So let's dive into OAuth and get our hands around what, what about it is uh, causing us uh, to change our view. Well, as consumers, we probably use OAuth every single day. You could be shopping at a website, and as soon as you check out and use electronic payments, in the US, uh, PayPal happens to be a little more popular. What the third-party application, in this case, the website does, is redirect the user, myself in this case, to PayPal, because the third-party website wants secure access to a resource of mine, my currency, my, my funds, which are uh, governed by PayPal. And so I'm redirected that securely. Um, I'm just dealing with PayPal. I do not store or give my username or, or password to the third-party app. And so this is good. This is an improvement in security and part of why OAuth was designed. I go through authentication. It could be more rigorous with multi-factor. And ultimately, I get to the last screen, which is the authorization screen. This is where I approve as a user, yes, whatever this app is asking for, this amount of money, maybe on a recurring payment schedule, 
I approve and I hit, hit okay or continue. And that works pretty well in the public internet. We do not see breaches and hacks of that uh, process. When, when hackers uh, attack that, they, they go more directly to the vendor's uh, website or systems, right? They, they're not attacking uh, OAuth in that picture. But let's talk about what's happening and what has been happening in the last year or two. Phishing attack, it's called the illicit consent grant. And I wanna review that quickly um, before we move on. So in this scenario, and apologize, we're gonna get a little bit more technical here with the diagrams. I have simplified the OAuth flow. This is not all of the details, just so we can understand the different parts of the attack chain and what's happening there. It starts with attacker not creating a fake website, which is our traditional model of phishing, but a fake OAuth application. It is a piece of code. It could be a website. It could also be a local or mobile um, you know, desktop application. Uh, the attacker, must register that within an identity environment, uh, Azure, we're talking about Microsoft in this, this example, but it could be um, any other application environment. And they provide a couple of things, uh, permissions that they're gonna ask the user of have to be itemized, uh, a redirection URL, which is a way to be notified of important information during the OAuth handshake process. It's, it's how the attacker's app gets ultimately gets codes that, that give them credentials. Um, and we'll talk about that later. And then they might have to go through a verification or validation process. So what's changed now is playing within the OAuth world and creating an actual OAuth app, which is important. They will fish the victim and try to uh, give them a link that doesn't go to a website, but in this case, sends them off to the identity provider. This is Microsoft uh, as an example. So it would be to, uh, Microsoft AD and Azure, just like the shopping example, the user will be presented with, do you want to grant this O365 access app, uh, you know, uh, certain privileges, it might show a screen uh, like this. This would be presented by Microsoft. Some of the information here was created by uh, the attacker, such as the list of permissions. And you can see in red, there's perhaps an overprivileged permission. Uh, Office, this fake Office 365 app might be asking for full read-write access to all files uh, in OneDrive. And, but this is coming from Microsoft. If you looked at the URL traffic, it's coming from valid domain. So the user is tricked into accepting that. And as soon as they do, they authenticate and hit that authorization confirmation, the attackers won because they get what they need, which is the OAuth tokens, and all the REST API calls today um, support OAuth tokens directly. That's everyone's adopted it. And so now the attacker has full access as that user for that list of permissions to the resource in question, right? So if we fish right, the attacker in this case would have access to OneDrive as well as maybe the regular office data. And today, the cloud resources, of course, are immense, right? It is not just your office and your email, it's your Azure cloud environment, it's your Google it's, uh, cloud environment, it's your Salesforce or your CRM, it's your, your Dropbox or your corporate uh, box, whatever you may use, Google Drive, et cetera. So in this case, you can start to see that attackers are adapting to the protocol. What about the defenses? Okay, this, this is the, probably one of the easiest attacks. Well, the problem is in blue, I've outlined sort of natural points where we might assume we have defenses based on our past thinking with, with uh, phishing of traditional websites. URL inspection I had mentioned earlier and makes sense is a key component of today's phishing defenses. They are highly ineffective. Why? Because the URLs involved, whether they're come inbound on the phishing uh, message or after the user clicks, same URL, it's Microsoft.com or a valid Microsoft domain, a valid Microsoft cert, and it's common. Uh, for the most part, it is common to no matter which application is asking uh, for permission. So blocking that uh, usually would uh, bring your user's uh, productivity down to zero, right? And it's not viable. Well, what else can we do? Well, often if we move beyond uh, prevention, we deal with techniques to mitigate compromised credentials. Multi-factor authentication, if deployed, can be highly effective. 
traditionally with stolen or compromised credentials. The problem is it's not effective in a token system. What do I mean by that? OAuth is a temporary token system and all of these work much like web session, uh, which is another session token uh, system. Authentication is done up front and then users are presented with a token that represents successful authentication. It means the attacker will never be presented with another MFA challenge until that token expires or is invalidated. And the problem with OAuth is it is uh, almost uh, permanent as a model and we'll talk about that more. But right now the key point to remember is MFA will not help. Uh, it only applied to step uh, when the user uh, in step two and three was authenticating directly with Microsoft. That's when MFA is presented. Well, what about other uh, security operations techniques? Well, we'll talk about locking down app approvals, but if we move down further into the process of reacting to this uh, uh, potential compromise, revoking tokens are gonna be incomplete in the challenge uh, because it's a very different set of technologies. And I just mentioned that these tokens for all intents and purposes are are permanent um, for the attacker. So temporary as a defense or security measure um, is a bad idea, but it doesn't even apply to OAuth and, and we shouldn't fool ourselves despite um, how it's been presented. So let's talk about where we can actually make a difference in this scenario. Let me flip back. We can try to ver uh, upfront at step one during the, uh, creation of the fake app, we can try to detect and prevent that. How? Well, we don't really know what a fake app is. That's another problem. There is no DNS registry equivalent in the OAuth world. There is no registry of these are real apps. It is true the vendors verify and validate, but that information is not accessible to anyone. So it's effectively useless. But what you can do is take the complementary approach. We don't know what's fake, we may want to control what's authorized and approved, and we have to take those measures, right? So in Microsoft's world, you have three options. You could centralize approval process. Let's take it out of the hands of the users who are more susceptible to phishing attacks and centralize it with administrators, or we'll only allow approved apps. We're not sure what, you know, what went into it, but it, it passed the approval process of the vendor. And of course, the last option is we can keep it wide open and that's usually the default. Don't do that, right? This is part of us thinking ahead. So this is a reasonable step on the defensive side, but I want to go through in more detail a second attack that's going to render some of those assumptions uh, moot. Okay, uh, let me acknowledge that Dr. Cinema, the link at the bottom 18 months ago blogged about this. He's a great resource on Microsoft. Uh, uh, attacks, uh, not just phishing attacks, but Microsoft and AD. Okay, I've pre-recorded a demo. Let's, and let me explain quickly. On the left is the, the victim or the uh, someone who get phished at it, Feast Health. They are just logging into Outlook. Um, there's nothing special except multi-factor is turned on and they get into their Outlook 365. On the right side, I'm presenting a terminal session and it's very busy, so I will just highlight the key points there. The attacker um, in parallel is deciding to fish the user on the left. And I'll point out what they're doing is they have a small piece of code. This is not an OAuth app. They don't even have a Microsoft or Azure account. They have just about 50 lines of code and they are starting an OAuth dance. They are starting to engage an OAuth directly with Microsoft using what's called a device code flow. It is a part of OAuth that was designed for smart TVs to get access to say your Netflix subscription or your video subscription. So if you can read the terminal, I'll point out that some of the data that is passed from the attacker to Microsoft is a client ID. It's a unique application ID. When you create an OAuth app, you get a unique ID by Microsoft. Well, what's going on here? The attacker has not created an app. No, they're reusing an existing client ID, Outlooks in fact, Outlook 365, That should make a note of that. There was no password or secret required. It's publicly known information. They are assuming Outlook's identity in this scenario, this fish. They also specify a resource, Microsoft terminology, 
sort of a broad category of APIs. The graph API will give access to Outlook information and some Active Directory information. What they get back from Microsoft, bear with me, I know this gets confusing and that is part of the problem, a very complicated protocol. They get two codes back, a user code and a device code. You can see it on the screen if it's not too small. It, it expires in 900 seconds, 15 minutes to use these codes. They will keep the device code, they will fish the user with the user code. Those together are, are gonna allow the, the attacker to get OAuth credentials in a minute. Let's move on and actually see the email sent out. The user code is included. I'm highlighting that right there. The URL that will be sent in the fish is a standard Microsoft URL used in this um, OAuth flow. It shows up on the left, the user clicks on it. Please appreciate this for five seconds. I spent a lot of time with my HTML skills, which are poor, but I created a phishing uh, message for increasing Outlook at file storage to one terabyte and the attachment size to 100 megabytes. What user wouldn't want this promotional, just type in this promotional code, right? Go to this official Microsoft URL, type in the promotional code and you will get all this space so that you can send uh, cat videos and uh, your favorite video to your uh, friends over email, which uh, many users probably still wanna do. So I want to note that the user is following the fish. They did, they were fooled, they are clicking. The first thing they do is type in the code. It's a generic screen. This is served up from Microsoft, by the way. No one's created this. No one's uh, has ability to change this. That's step one. Meanwhile, um, right after that, step two, what the user is faced with is to log in. There is a cache session from the Outlook uh, uh, tab. Uh, but if this were a new browser session, they would go through a full authentication and MFA included. And this is all dealing with Microsoft. The attacker is not in the middle of this. That's not how OAuth works. This is working as expected and normal. The third thing that they see, the user, keep track of this because this is the user experience, which is important when we talk about security. Are you trying to sign into Microsoft Office? A very standard dialogue, though the type of application would depend on what's being used. Microsoft Office shows up because the attacker assumed the identity of Outlook 365. If you created an OAuth app, you get to choose your title. There's not much checking on it these days. Microsoft will check on keywords. So you can't quite pick Outlook, but if you did Outlook uh, or Azure 365, that might get through, okay? It's not the most rigorous. It's the early days, much like uh, the mobile app stores uh, ten, 10 years ago, right? The fourth thing that they see and the final thing that the user sees is you've signed in. That's it, okay? Just bear that in mind. That's what the user sees during this fish. Not, nothing particularly suspicious. The language might be a little generic, but nothing particularly suspicious. They did not get presented with, do you wanna grant Outlook access to all of this data and so on and so forth? Okay, it was pretty generic. Meanwhile, on the right, let's go back to the attacker screen. The attacker, will be able to get user credentials in the form of OAuth tokens right now because the, the uh, user has finished authentication. So you'll see this scroll and a whole bunch of information is now returned to the attacker, okay? And if you can look at this, I know it's really busy, I'm gonna highlight a few fields, okay? The scope is typically, is OAuth language for permissions. The attacker never asked for it or specified it, but they got back a clarity clarification of what permissions they have, uh, which is a lot of read write access on, on office uh, information. They have an access token. The access token is key. That's the longest piece in the bottom half of the screen. It is the OAuth token that now gives them full access to what the user has uh, and what those permissions specify. The attacker did ask for graph uh, API access, since that's clarified in the response. There's also what's called a refresh token. You just have to remember there are two tokens involved in OAuth. The access token is what's used for current access, expires typically in one hour. And then all you have to do is use that refresh token to get a new one. That's it. That's The refresh token usually doesn't expire unless you don't use it for several months or unless it's explicitly revoked. So for all intents and purposes, the attacker has permanent access in this scenario. 
okay, so what's the user, uh, the attacker going to do? Well, I'm going to show on the right that they're going to use that access token to enumerate AD users. There are three AD users, and we'll just double check live. This user logged into Azure, and there are the three users. They can also access the user's email. Three messages, you can see them printed out. And there are three emails just to verify. Now here's the pivot, here's the lateral movement. It gets worse. If this weren't bad enough, this fish, it gets worse here. They can use the, what happened, a lot just scrolled. They can use that refresh token not to get another access token for Office 365 or Graph API. They can get it for Azure Access without supplying anything more to verify identity or author, uh, authorization. So let's look at the, the output. S stay with me, I know this is confusing. My head hurts looking at it, but the key things here, the attacker switched the resource in their request. They specified management.azure.com and Microsoft gladly returned a fresh new access token that represents permissions on that. What permissions? It says user impersonation at the top. It essentially means all access that Ed has in Azure was given. We didn't even have to ask for it. We got everything. Well, Ed, the user happens to be a Azure global admin. So full access to Azure has now been gotten easily by the attacker along with a refresh token. So now what's happening on the right is the attacker continues on and uses that new access token to enumerate all resources in uh, Azure. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of resources. They have rewrite, but we'll just look. It's the Azure subscription, subscription one is showing. And just to convince ourselves, I have the user looking in their portal, Azure portal, and it all matches up, right? All of the compute instances, all of the disks, all the SSH keys, all of the buckets or storage accounts and containers and files. Okay, I'm gonna move on in the interest of time, but here's the architectural sort of flow diagram of what just happened. And it's really important. Highlighted in yellow are sort of important parts. The red, it tends to be the attack side, blue will be the defensive side if that weren't apparent. One key difference versus the first attack, assumed application identity. No code was created in terms of OAuth app code. The attacker had a little script, but they assumed by just using and passing in a known ID, they assumed the identity of Office 365. There, there are huge implications. When we get up to the SecOps view of the world, all that's gonna show in the events or in logs is Office 365 and the user doing stuff. There is not a fake app ID or a new unknown app ID to detect. During the authorization stage, you may have noticed but I wanna point out that the generic dialogues presented, nothing was ever explicit about the consent, asking the user for consent. Do you want Office 365 to have access to whatever the graph API gives them, which includes some AD enumeration of users. That sounds suspicious, right? But that's what the user actually granted. There was definitely nothing presented to the user about do you want Office 365 to access all of your Azure cloud environment? and the last piece in this attack that was new and, and troubling is in fact the pivot, the lateral movement from Office 365 to Azure with no additional work required by the attacker other than an additional call to say, please give me a new fresh access token. So let's talk about defenses. We've already talked about some of these with the first attack, the illicit consent grant. Let's talk about the new challenges. Well, if you can follow this busy slide, <clears throat> let's go to step three in the red where the user's dealing with Microsoft Authenticate and they didn't really get a consent or approval screen that was very explicit. Well, unfortunately, you can't force a better approval screen. That is not an option. How about this assumed application identity upfront? This idea, can, can we prevent that? No, there are no controls to prevent. It's a hard problem to, 
to detect as well. How do you know that someone's reusing the Office Outlook 365 application ID? Um, you can't prevent that pivot. In fact, it's not even logged. So if we talk about it from a SecOps perspective, the logging, this is where it's, it's uh, uh, lacking and incomplete. You don't even know <clears throat> that that re second refresh uh, uh, access token uh, uh, happened that switched access effectively from Office 365 to Azure. Let's talk about other SecOps uh, uh, sort of controls or measures that we might typically think of. Well, we had the approved app list, which could help mitigate that first scenario that, right, if I have an approved list then anything that's not matching, like a fake OAuth app, I might be able to prevent. Well, it's not going to apply here. Why? Because we didn't create a fake OAuth app. The attacker created or reused an existing application, and it's a very popular one. So most likely every Microsoft customer has Office 365 on their approved app list to begin with. The pivot's not logged, we talked about that. Okay, so let's move on. What, what else could we do? If we were just reacting, going, brainstorming, we might say, look, this was a particular device flow. It's not the mainstream popular OAuth um, interaction that we see on the web. This was designed for smart TVs. And if you think about that, why should we be allowing approvals for smart TVs to get access to video streaming? The use case is weak. Why don't we just block the device flow? And we can do that. This doesn't solve all the problems. It would mitigate the second attack. Why? Because the URL path, not the domain, the URL paths that are involved are listed there. And all you have to know is it contains device in it and it is unique. It would not conflict with the normal OAuth flows that apply to other application grants and access. That sounds good, except there are exceptions. There are always exceptions. And in this case, there are some valid apps that use Microsoft device flow that may be important. If you are an Azure uh, shop, you have valid apps, namely an admin tool, the CLI tool, Azure CLI, in certain cases will not use a browser to authenticate uh, it has an option to use only text and command line and device flow. So you could still break functionality for users, but it's a better problem to deal with in my mind than allowing all of this in. Deal with the 1%, not the 99%. Well, you might ask, okay, this is, this is all bad. Am I safe if I'm a Google customer? Because Google implements OAuth, uh, including device flow. Well, the short answer is it shares a lot of the same risks, but they've mitigated it. So you can feel good. You still see a flow that's very similar here. This was impersonating not Outlook 365, but the Google Cloud SDK, which includes their CLI admin tool. And you can get a successful uh, result. So some of the same risks are there. You can assume and reuse an existing app. There's no consent presented in most cases. But the thing that Google did in their implementation that was better is they limited the privileges you obtained and you, you are effectively sandboxed. You cannot pivot out of that. So the damage is contained. You can be fished, but your whole environment uh, is not necessarily um, at risk. You might ask, is all of this a problem just with this device flow? Because if it is, we can, we can just treat that and feel good about but what this authorization code grant flow is what's used on the internet with, with the internet shopping as an example, but it's, it's the predominant part of OAuth. Well, the answer is mostly, but no, there are, you are exposed there too. So here's a third phishing attack that uses the main one, the one that most people feel very safe and comfortable because it's proven every day with consumer shopping, among other things. There's an extension, a customization to it. OAuth allowed customizations of certain things like uh, the redirection mechanism of how an application receives codes to get the, the secrets, uh, the OAuth tokens. OOB, out of band, bad name. It means copy and paste. What does that mean? Let me show you an action. I can create a web page that doesn't give a, it's a fish, doesn't give the code up front. It tells the user, go to this real Google URL. After you log in, you'll get your special code. 
So I created this fish, which says you're an important Google customer. You get to meet our engineers to your product roadmaps, just sign up. I'm targeting you as a technical user. They go through this process, Google Cloud SDK. They end up with a code. This is actual normal OAuth presented by Google. Attackers done a few things like impersonated the, the Cloud SDK and they get a copy paste code. If I can get the user to paste it in, I have that code, which gives me the keys to the kingdom. I now have their OAuth tokens. So what happened underneath? Bear with me. I know this is super complicated. It's part of the problem. I was still able to assume the application identity, but because Google extended the OAuth protocol to introduce, normally the OAuth token is sent programmatically to a redirection URL. So it's hard to intercept that, but sometimes that comes through the user, including a manual copy paste request. So once that's done, I can fish the user to give me that code and I win. So the only thing that matters is not at this stage, understanding the nitty gritty details there. It's to know that this is not just part of OAuth, different aspects, including the most popular part of OAuth has certain risks where you can, the identities of, of apps can be assumed. And there's no 900 second or 15 minute time period to act and fish with the device flow attacks, the second attack, the Microsoft attack. I had to get the user to respond within 15 minutes, which is still very doable if I smish them or send a chat message. But in this case, I bypassed that. There's no weakness there. And I get still get full cloud access, just like I had full Azure access. So. At the end of the day, is this hopeless? Is this turning worse and worse? No. Part of our strategy on the defensive side is those of us with direct relationships with vendors like Google and Microsoft need to get their help. We need to raise the issue. And in this case, we did do disclosure over a year ago um, of this. And I believe that helped Google uh, phase out this copy and paste customization. It is still supported so it still works, but by October, it should be phased out, which should make this third attack um, mitigated and ineffective. So, but let's talk about this in a more structured way because going through this in a haphazard knee-jerk reaction is exactly what we cannot do, right? We need to get ahead and stop reacting. So that hopefully that's what we can talk about for the rest of this session. And it all starts with cabbage. Cabbage, what is cabbage? Well. 2,600 years ago, Draco was a Greek legislature and cabbage was one of the most highly prized assets. And there was a capital offense if you stole cabbage. So really I'm trying to say, if there's one thing to take away, treat your assets, your cloud assets like cabbage and then act like Draco. And security professionals uh, for the most part are very used to this. It's really, should we say the CEOs, the business side, the other folks who, who don't want to necessarily take draconian measures. And what do I mean by that? I really mean a deny all policy by default all the time for everyone, everywhere, right? If anything, this is what is under the buzzword zero trust today. Let's go back to not trusting anything, right? You are guilty until you're proven somewhat trustworthy, but I'm still gonna watch you. And I just wanna point out, deny all in case my accent is bad. That's two words and it's not denial right? Cabbages, not ostriches. So let's dive into what we can practically do with a new view. I'm going to go through a wheel of stages of security ops, but I'm going to throw in some dose of proactive measures, upfront research, and then innovation. We have to get proactive. So if the attackers are adjusting to OAuth, we need to adjust to OAuth and we need to stay ahead. Easier said than done, but let's give it a shot. So what kind of research? Well, we have to know there's a lot of, uh, of education about OAuth, but there's a lot of resources out there. This is doable. It's ubiquitous, more ubiquitous than we can probably uh, know beforehand until we do research. Every single SaaS app uh, supports it, not just Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, CRM, file shares, Dropbox, all the SSO vendors that speak SAML uh, for single sign-on also speak OAuth for authorization but there are not so obvious uses of OAuth that we need to understand and pull out. Microsoft doesn't say that their CLI uses device code authorization, but when you look at it, 
and you know auth, it strangely looks like device code authorization. And then you can validate and look at the traffic and you know it. You don't have to do this all yourself. Someone does it, they share it. You need to know that. Same with Google CLI. Underneath, you can access Google Cloud and you can have OAuth tokens cached at the endpoint that has that um, Google CLI, CLI installed that becomes an attack point. You need to know these things in order to know what to protect. And basically I'm trying to say, <clears throat> treat protocols as seriously as data users and applications. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because certainly we are on the lookout for CDEs for SSL. We don't want to be surprised by the next heart bleed. There's plenty with <clears throat> SSH as well, RDP. You know, most of the TCP protocols have their problems and they are on our list. Please add OAuth to it. They are horizontal protocols that tend to affect a whole multitude of applications and environments. And then we have to acknowledge and then manage that this started as a user-driven, more consumer-based uh, protocol. And that means a lot of the defaults are wide open so that it's easy for consumers or small organizations to just approve app access, approve app access. So this is the sales side of the vendors, I think, uh, influencing default settings that influence security. Uh, hard to change that, but if we acknowledge it, maybe we're a little more proactive in taking draconian measures to lock things down. At the end of the day, also take away, OAuth is all about tokens. Those are the key to everything. Those will be under attack. They have their characteristics like being later or after MFA and authentication. They're often unmanaged, hard to track from the vendor side. You don't have visibility, not great. Logging's limited. Prevention's difficult. Revocation's challenging. But there's hope you can leverage existing processes that you for uh, security operations processes for dealing with compromise and detection, but the details will differ. That's where we have to put in the work. And you have to remember it's not temporary. Temporary is not security, but don't let anyone even try to fool you into it, it, it's there. It's permanent. Okay. And because it's a token system, expect other attack vectors besides phishing, people will outright try to steal them. There were uh, recently in the last month or so, there was a, just a published article about a, a fairly complicated web attack involving SSRF and other web techniques to get Google OAuth tokens, which are used uh, in single sign-on to, to have access to Facebook. Very complicated and not having anything to do with phishing uh, directly or traditionally, but because it's a token system, attackers are going after tokens and expect that. So let's go into nuts and bolts, security ops. First thing, know what you don't know. And almost everyone I expect doesn't know where they're at. So let's just ask and get a baseline. Where do you go? Almost all the vendors have some kind of auditing. The vendors that provide the resources and the authentication and, and the authorization. So Azure in this case, um, you can get access to it figure out what applications are being approved, what permissions are requesting and which users are doing that. Okay, you don't know, you don't know how big the problem is. Get to know the problem. Here is Azure's console, right? They have APIs, of course, it's very busy, but it shows the user at the bottom. It shows the application IP address of the request, um, the application ID over on the right. If you get that data together, you can just do some manual massaging and throw it in a spreadsheet. Um, you don't have to be fancy. Um, I did an analysis of well over a year ago, but it's a big data set. So, so a lot of the trends are the same, over 500,000 users with multiple anonymous customers, but it was big enough that it, it would probably reflect uh, some of the biggest enterprises and probably give us some idea. You'll see uh, trends that you expect, and then you'll see some surprises. Uh, Google Chrome, no surprise. That's one of the biggest approved OAuth type apps. Uh, Slack, maybe. Um, oh. Pinterest, consumer app, Glassdoor, looking for jobs, Postman, technical tool, right? Some might surprise you, at least figure that out. You can go deeper than the apps. You can start to look at the permissions and scopes. What's what's asking for read, write? Read, write for Google Drive, right? Read, write an email, right? What's asking for broad permissions? And if you do that, you have a much better chance of having the right policies to sort of uh, focus on the hotspots. So let's come back to prevention and blocking specifically. We talked about blocking 
uh, being highly ineffective, but maybe for some things like device code flow, you could block it in mass because you just don't allow it. You should do it. Even if you have exceptions like Azure CLI, start with no way are we allowing this part of OAuth in our environment. And then let the justification say, no, I have to have an exception because I manage Azure and I don't have access to a browser, blah, blah, blah. We have to go back to lockdown. What can we do for lockdown? You can absolutely set these consent settings. Uh, there's a version in every vendor that controls identity and authorization, and you start with the most severe and strict one. It means you have work to do. It means that you have to convince probably management chain business side that it's worth doing. And you're basically gonna say, here are 10 enterprise apps, here are 30. Everything else someone has to justify. These are the only things that are allowed or only the admin does it. If you have a good business reason, you tell me why you need a third-party app to go access every spreadsheet on Google Drive. Yeah, just tell me that. There is problems with it, doesn't solve everything. It will not work for the second attack, which is a Microsoft One, because Outlook is an existing valid app, probably already approved. But layers of defense, let's chip away at the problem in small pieces. Take your win with one attack, and then we'll worry about the other ones. What about mitigation? I put this under prevention, but let's assume you have compromised credentials. You can do things. There are things that will work. There are IP allow lists with almost every vendor. Microsoft's version is conditional access policies. It allows you to also take in, into account uh, device or managed endpoints. You can put those in place. So just in case you get compromised and they have OAuth tokens and they execute API calls, attackers, if they don't do it from approved IPs, they will be blocked. That of course brings up a difficult problem, which is can you have a small set of IPs that your valid users work from? Take some work, not every organization can do it. And I'm saying you have to start there. You have to use proxies or VPNs or uh, uh, private access to cloud apps. You have to do something to reduce your, your IP footprint. So then that you can mitigate these severe um, problems uh, uh, like some of these OAuth attacks. And so Microsoft, you know, they have a GUI one, they even set it with API and nothing fancy here. It's what you would expect. What about timeouts? Well, there are some controls, not consistent, but some vendors have an ability to timeout that session token. It's like the web model that we've done forever since the internet started, where if you are after a period of inactivity, you're forced to log in again, but that's not the norm in OAuth. Not sure why they chose to ignore 20 plus years of web learning about uh, attacks. And so Google has a timeout, Microsoft doesn't. Salesforce, I think does. You look in your app settings, it's obvious right off from the admin side. And if it's there, take it. If it's not, okay, we'll deal with it. If you put in IP allow lists, you can do early warning detection. This is, you have to be careful of false positives, but if you have failures, if your users are trained and you've deployed a restricted set of IPs that should be accessing your cloud resources, then any violation you can start to look at, uh, right? Train your users up, but any failed logins, maybe an early warning that there's a compromised credential out there used by an attacker on an unauthorized IP. And there's ways to delve into it, to See if immediately there's a successful one, you know, one if users forgot to jump on, you know, a VPN and then right after they remembered, or if the attacker keeps doing failure because they, they, they don't know, uh, you know, a, a policies in place. Something to consider because it's an early warning system and then you, you can jump into remediation immediately before there's damage done. The problem though with compromise uh, uh, and credentials is it's a behavioral problem for the most part, it's hard to reduce to simple rules. So our best bet is to have good machine learning applied to it. And we've been at this as an industry for way too long. So I'm not saying that's easy. And it's generally a vendor problem because almost none of us have resources to build our own, but this is the discussion we have to push the vendors on. And, and there's hope because there are ML-based detection products in all of the cloud vendors. Microsoft has Cloud Defender uh, uh, for apps, uh, Defender for cloud apps, I'm sorry, the name keeps changing and it's ML-based. And 
the good news is some of the use cases are compromise or risky OAuth apps. This is great news. Microsoft accepts that there might be some risk here. It is time to engage in this dialogue with them of how can you help us detect abnormal account activity? Let's move into mitigation. What can we do there? I, I've been alluding to re revocation is, is, is hard or incomplete, or, or let's talk about in detail what I mean. Remember, there's two tokens anyone gets during the OAuth process. One is the access token, which is the immediate access. And then when that expires in typically an hour, you refresh it with a refresh token. Microsoft provides you a nice API. That is, I applaud them because not every vendor does that. However, it's incomplete. It only revokes the refresh token. And if you dig into the um, documentation, it is explained clearly and it, you can test it as well. The first dialog says, here's the API called the PowerShell uh, commandlet. It invalidates the refresh tokens. It doesn't quite tell you, it ignores the access token, but it tells you what it does. The second one, if you dig deeper, says, well, for access tokens, it's a different part of the doc. The user loses access when this token expires. Huh? So you have an up to an hour exposure. Well, how do you, how do you revoke the access token? Well, the third one sort of clarifies, well, if you're still concerned, well, we're working on it. It's called this, it's part of our continuous access, it's a roadmap response, which no one ever wants to hear, but it's better than nothing. So basically, I think that the engineer wrote the first one and gave it the documentation, I'm done. The engineering manager wrote the second one and said, well, you know, yeah, yeah there's the access token and don't worry, it expires. And the third one was the product manager who wrote it, which is, oh, don't worry, it's on the roadmap. These are the things we have to deal with. The first is to know what you're dealing with. This still helps better than nothing. So what can you do about that access token? This is mitigation, this is security ops. Hope's not a strategy, but I wanna give you hope. So what you can do based on my testing, disable the user account in AD for one hour, the max typically that access token. When you disable the user account, the token is not valid. So after the hour, you're safe at that point. And then after the hour, the token disappears, is invalidated, and you can re-enable the account. That will work. It's probably the most reasonable one. You can also delete and restore the user account. That's probably dramatically uh, impactful, but it'll work. And there's no questions about that. Delete the user, restore it. So if you're one of those that have real-time backups of user information, then Two will, will let you sleep at night. But don't forget about other things that have authentication and access. In Microsoft's world, there's devices you also have to worry about. So you have to apply that thinking to there. So if you get through all of that, that's sort of the active sort of incident part, you still have to analyze and get better for the future. So I'm suggesting um, that you take a look at your high-risk users and you look at your, if you have URL filtering of any kind, proc, web proxies, et cetera, look at the URL logs. And I'm not suggesting this has to be real time and, and, and super tedious, but look for certain URLs. Like you, if you're worried about the second attack, you could look at ones that are involved in the second Microsoft device login attack. And what you're looking for is early warning signs, you're trying to get out of being reactive and so incident focused. And you're trying to see if you have users being targeted, all users spear phishing, a few users, this is an advanced attack, try to get ahead of it. You would have to ideally dig into the parameters and headers, not just the URI path to get a big, a better picture of the OAuth traffic, right? So you might really wanna see if the application IDs that are being re, you know, passed back and forth or the scopes requested are unusual, okay? That's getting advanced, it's more data, but you work, take baby steps, start looking. And if you do, you might be able to aggregate data and take a look at which applications are highest in terms of approval or use, what are being tr uh, trusted. And this goes to a different source. This goes back to the audit logs of the identity provider. And you might focus on just a few high risk users, your CEO and executive team and your admins, because they have the most to lose. They have the most access once they're compromised, right? You can be practical. But the important part is we have to start thinking about this, not reacting, not doing an incident response flow, but we have to do more of a threat hunting flow, a longer term analysis flow. You can look at applications, of course, and 
request uh, scopes and privileges. You can get very detailed here. I've talked about some of this. Um, certainly apps that are used by a large number of users have the most aggregate potential risk, but I would say that's not really where you wanna look because those tend to be the most visible applications well-known and have the most scrutiny on them. It, it's not to say Google or Slack might not be, or Zoom might not be compromised. Of course, we, we probably are still suffering from solar winds and other fallouts of popular apps, but it is to say there's a much better chance that those are scrutinized. What you want to be aware of is the unused apps or the rarely used apps, the one-offs. And so if I plot a two-dimensional table of number of users of, you know, using or approving these apps versus the types of permissions, broad and narrow, I'm really worried about the upper left. That's the hidden risk that has huge impact. This, why did this one user approve this unknown app from this unknown vendor that has read write access to everything. That's where, right? If Slack were compromised, everyone would be looking at it. They would be embarrassed and avoid lawsuits. You would have a problem, but there would be patches immediately and a lot of analysis, but no one would, would be looking at the bottom or the top left. And just as an example, from some manual analysis on this broad data set that, uh, that I did uh, last year, Cam Scanner popped up, only used by 0.04% of the users, but it wanted rewrite access to everything in Google Drive. And if you did a quick investigation, it was banned by the Indian government because first we had point, one point had it um, delivering malware. And even if that were fixed, it points out how that one-off could pose huge risk and that's what you want to get your hands around if it's existing in your environment by doing some analysis. The obscure applications where you don't know the reputation of the developer. And remember, our hands are tied. We do not have a DNS registry that we can go do domain analysis and figure out if, if this, is, this publisher is valid. You, you don't know. Sometimes that appears in the user consent dialog, but it, you don't have access to that kind of intel. At the end of the day, we don't know absolutely what's gonna be high risk and low risk. Just start looking at what you have and the changes. New apps, new scopes, top end, look at the distribution. That's good enough for the coming year. Those changes will help you highlight changes in risk. And finally, and I know we're running late, I wanna leave some time for questions. Just try to anticipate, as we say uh, with ice hockey, uh, you know, skate to where the puck is, Try to anticipate what's evolving in the protocol, but get to knowing what you don't know. Inventory, assume that there's gonna be other attacks that are non-phishing and try to be proactive by looking at early warning indicators. And you can actually develop what I call threat intel, sounds fancy, but for yourself, for your set of approved apps, you can start to figure out what are valid app IDs by looking in logs. And that will help during incidents to verify, is this really Outlook 365 or is it a fake one, right? For your small set, as you test and install apps or approve them, you can do the work to determine what are the valid signs based on the logs, and that will help. So I'm going to stop, but I do have some slides that you can review um, if, if we can get copies out of how you can do concrete steps to apply this, right? A lot of this is you can apply checklists, ask yourself the right questions, ask vendors the same questions, try to answer them to understand what you're being faced with and ultimately get to a point where you can start to be proactive and start refining your policies uh, and go through everything that we talked about today. And then if you wanna educate yourself, I have some links that um, will be a good starting point. So on that, I want to end, uh, apologize. If there are questions, please uh, post them if you haven't already, and we'll try to answer them. Thank you, Chanko. We are running short of time. I'll, I'll just quickly jump to the q and So the first question is, uh, if the OAuth token expired in short time, like five minutes, would that help better? Yeah, so good question. Will it, if it, if there's a short expiration period, five minutes, um, yes, it would. As long as we realize that any temporary duration is not, really solving the problem, but it will certainly mitigate it. Uh, it. In different cases may be balanced with usability, but because OAuth has a refresh token, then part of what apps do automatically is if there's an expired 
access token, they will immediately refresh and it's unseen, it's invisible to the user. So the user's not affected, they don't complain. The app does a little bit more work, a little more chatty. And, and that's a good part, that, that would be super viable. Uh, now, just realize there are some apps that, that don't do that. And if you're in an interactive CLI, you may be forced to re-log in. So some users will still complain, but it's a small set of apps. Why are you forcing me to log in? So really, you're generally choosing between one hour and eight hours, which is sort of what you choose for maybe production, web, or apps. But it is up to you. You could certainly go short. That makes sense. Uh, moving on to the next question. So this is a question that arises from the demo. For the demo shown in phishing attack, is device code a non-issue for a particular OAuth flow? Can this be mitigated by using auth code exchange or pixie challenge? Um, so interesting question. The problem with device code flow and OAuth in general is it's very hard to layer on top of it extra authentication or authorization um, uh, pieces. So if they're at completely different layers, I'd have to think about that. Yes, it would be doable. If it's at the application layer, you might have some trouble inserting into it. They didn't what would be useful is if OAuth had better hooks, but then if you have hooks to, to be more secure, there are hooks to also uh, abuse um, as well. Um, but I think that would be worth exploring. I haven't um, actually thought about that. Awesome. Uh, and uh, a follow-up question on that, uh, does this only affect the application that uses device flow, the attack that you have shown, or is it vulnerable to any other? Flows? So, it is multiple applications. Device code, if we're talking about that part of the OAuth flow is not popular, but there's hidden dependencies. So it was designed for smart TVs. You're thinking, oh, well, that's easy. But then there's a copy paste mentality among developers. So once you see it, you're like, oh, I'm in Microsoft, I'm an engineer, why not just use that? And I'm the CLI developer and on and on it goes, copy and pasting code. So. From an OWASP perspective, you can see how development practices are going to lead to it's a much wider exposure than you typically expect. So, and then outside of apps, um, Google has its version, other apps, right? Um, so, generally, I would say no, you have to assume it affects a large number of apps. It's just finding and understanding that is actually part of the challenge. Got it. And I have like multiple people asking whether the script can be shared as well as the slides. So is absolutely, absolutely. There is a, um, we can get that through the OWASP uh, folks, both the slide deck and the script is uh, open sourced. And I, I can point people to that public uh, repo and that can all be distributed. Thank you. Uh, we have another question about the same. So uh, is the access token, which was like 900 second valid, why was the token giving access to the huge list of resources? Was this particularly for the demo or like, yeah. Mm, okay, good question. And I apologize because we didn't have enough time to go through hours and hours of the gory details. It's an excellent question. Okay, device code has some unique characteristics. When you initiate it, you're in control. So the attackers in control to get this user code and device code, those last for 15 minutes. Uh, if you try to use them, one's used by the user when they authenticate, one's used by the attacker to achieve OAuth tokens. So you have a time limit to use them. Otherwise, you have to regenerate them. It's easy to regenerate. That is a separate time frame from once the OAuth tokens are actually obtained, after the user authenticates and authorizes and the attacker grabs OAuth tokens, the second time limit, which is different, is that access token. And that uh, in almost all implementations has a um, one hour time limit, but you always have the refresh tokens. So for all intents and purposes, no one notices the hour. It's just built into the protocol that you can effectively refresh it almost indefinitely. But for some reason, we're gonna make you refresh like once an hour or you can do it later, right? Uh, it's just, you're gonna refresh. Um, uh, as much as that. So 
the first one affects the attacker, the time frame to, to get the user to respond. The second one affects nobody. It, it's a detail, but, but you have a refresh token, so it affects nobody. Uh, that brings us uh, to the end of the Q&A. Thank you, Jenko, for this great presentation and wonderful session. And uh, for all the follow-up questions, you can like contact him on the Hua platform. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.